Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Grape City webinar, Getting Started with Component One Controls. I'm Greg Lutz. I'm the Component One Product Manager, and I'll be joined here later today by Hunter Hoff. He's a technical engagement engineer, and together we will guide you through this training webinar. We're going to start with looking at a high level overview of what Component One provides. We're going to start and look at some demos, and then we're going to jump into some installation and licensing tips. And you'll also learn how to update the controls. And then I'm going to pass this off to Hunter, who will walk us through a beginner level coding example using FlexGrid for WinForms in Visual Studio. And he'll show us all the different resources that we have available. So Component One is a toolkit of .NET UI components that supports a wide range of development platforms and controls. Uh, we strive to support the entire .NET framework, or at least the most used interface platforms. Uh, over the past 20 years, this has included WinForms, WPF Compact Framework, ASP.NET, WPF Silverlight, WinRT, UWP, WinUI, Blazor, Xamarin, MAUI. And some of these platforms have become obsolete as technology and user requirements change. But this diagram here shows you what platforms we currently support. The best way to sort of learn everything that Component One offers is to really go to our website. So at grapesa.com, under products, you can select Component One. And here on the Component One page, we list all of the platforms and all of the controls that are available. So if you scroll down here, you can find out some of our popular .NET controls like FlexGrid, FlexChart, FlexReport that provides data grids, charts, reporting components, as well as all the different supported platforms that I just listed. All together, across all of the Component One platforms, we have over 400 controls. Now, this is broken up into all the various platforms. The number of controls that we have available in a platform is usually indicative of the success of that platform, meaning how long it's been around, how many people are using it. Microsoft is constantly evolving and updating the .NET framework to include new different new UI platforms that target the desktop, the web, and the mobile. And at Component One, you can license any single platform and get all of the controls in that platform. We typically license per platform and not per individual control. But we also do have one big bundle where you can get every platform together with Studio Enterprise. Now, whether you're just evaluating for the first time or whether you just purchased, usually the first thing that you're going to want to do is check out our demos. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through uh, sort of how you can evaluate our controls using the demos. And then we're going to go into look at the uh, how to install the controls using the C1 control panel. So to first access the demos, you can go to our website. And then along this top black bar here, you'll see a link called demos. Now, this page includes links to all of the demos broken out by .NET platform. For the web platforms like Blazor and ASP.NET, you can just view these demos directly in your browser. For the desktop demos like UWP, WinUI, WinForms, WPF, you would need to download our Demo Explorer. The Demo Explorer is just a simple little application that you can run on your Windows desktop, and it shows you different demos that you can download and install for various controls. Typically, for every platform, we offer a Control Explorer demo. The Control Explorer is the best place to start, and it's the best way to sort of see what we have available for a specific platform, what controls, and what features they provide. So here I'm running the WPF Control Explorer that I've downloaded and installed through the Demo Explorer app. I can click here and see, if at uh, click on Flex Chart, see some of the Flex Chart demos that we offer. And by looking through these demos, I can sort of get an idea of what the control can provide, what features are provided, as well as maybe even configure some certain properties right on the dis on the uh, the demo surface. Now we have a uh, these controls are broken out usually by category, like data management, data visualization, input, navigation, and layout. We even have scheduling and calendar controls. And what makes these demos nice is that you can quickly see the features that we provide without having to download the full product, without having to open Visual Studio or write any code. You can see what is possible just through the demos alone. One of my favorite controls is the Flex Pivot control. This allows you to sort of embed this runtime ad hoc report generation directly in your, your applications. This creates uh, you know, pivot tables and pivot grids similar, similar to what you'd see in Microsoft Excel.
One of our most popular controls is FlexGrid control. And we offer this across pretty much every platform. FlexGrid is a, flex a flexible and fast data bound data grid control. You can use it to display and analyze tabular data. So here I'm showing some row details. You can enable conditional formatting, which highlights certain values within the grid. You can enable grouping. You can even filter. And you can even export the grid to various formats like Excel, CSV, and PDF. The Hunter is going to be showing you a demo of how to use this control in a few minutes. The next step after you've gone through the demos, you've determined what the control can do, the next step would be to actually download and install the components to work with them inside Visual Studio. Again, from our website, from any of the Component One product pages, whether you're on the main Component One page or any of the addition pages, you will find a big download button at the top. And when you download that, you're going to get the C1 control panel, which is a web installer. We also publish all of our controls on NuGet. So NuGet is the new way to sort of just download the packages within Visual Studio. So it's good to know that all of our components are available on NuGet, that you could download them directly from there to get started. But I'm going to show you how to work with the C1 control panel next. <clears throat> when you launch the C1 control panel, it'll look like this, where you have all these different tiles that represent all the different platforms that we provide, including the legacy ones. And when you don't have a product installed, you'll see this little red label here that says not installed. So what you do is you open up the available versions, select which version you want, which will always be, or typically be the one at the top, which is the latest version. And then at the bottom, a proceed button will appear, and this will walk you through installing the product on your machine. But before you click proceed, you can also see over here, on there are options available to you. So for example, you can optionally install samples for a lot of these products. Some products even have different .NET Framework versions available. And in a few minutes, I will show you where exactly everything gets installed. But next, let me show you how you can later update the controls. So we have three major product releases every year. And typically what you, you could do is you could come back to the website after we have a new product release and you could do this whole process again of downloading the C1 control panel. But you really don't need to do that. First off, if you're using the NuGet packages, Visual Studio will alert you that an update is available. Or if you already have the C1 control panel installed, you can simply relaunch it you know, possibly from your, your downloads folder or wherever. And then this will actually update automatically and show you when new versions are available. So you can look for the little green banner that says a new version is available on a product that you already installed. And then all you have to do is open up the available versions, select the version, and now this will be added to the install list of all the things that you're gonna do. So when I click proceed, this will install the Blazor edition and it will also update my WPF version and here you can see on the WPF panel over here, the various .NET framework versions uh, that we have available. Now, we don't typically release a version of the controls for every version of .NET. So the typical rule is that you're going to want to look for the highest version that's available that's lower than the version of your application. So if you're building a .NET 4.8 application, you would want our .NET 4.6.2 controls. Now there's more that you can do here in the C1 control panel. You can also license your app, uh, your controls. So once you purchase any of the component one additions, you'll be given a serial key. So from this tab of the C1 control panel, you can simply just enter your name and company and the serial key and click activate. Licensing is that simple. And then when you build and run the applications, everything is automatically licensed for you if you're doing a standard deployment scenario. Another thing you can do is access various applications that we have available. So if, if you're working with the component one controls, you might hear of certain applications like the theme controller or the flex report designer. These applications are installed with the product and they can be launched from the apps tab of the C1 control panel. So for example, here I have the flex report designer running this is what you would use to create a report definition file that can then be loaded into FlexReport on any or all of the platforms where it's supported. 
And lastly, the last thing I want to show you here in the C1 control panel is our build repository tab. This tab allows you to download uh, a zip file of any specific version of the product. So if you don't want to run the full installer, if you just want to get a zip folder that contains the update, you can simply open up the platform node and search for the version of .NET that you're looking for and click update or download. Then select the version that you want, which is typically going to be the latest version. Uh, and then you'll see this little pop-up that shows up here where you can click download zip. And that's a handy little tool that I think most people are not aware of, but we do make that available for you. Now, next, let me show you where, I'm sorry, one more thing I need to show you in the Control Explorer is the Samples Explorer. So if you choose to install the samples, you can run the Samples Explorer, which will help you browse the samples on your machine. And what this is doing is this is essentially scraping the install folder of where you installed the samples. And it visually displays all the samples that are available to you that you installed. And you can search among them. You can read descriptions of the samples over here. And you can even launch them directly into Visual Studio. And this will show the samples that you have installed. So if you haven't installed anything, you won't see any samples. And here, obviously, I've installed pretty much everything. Now, let me show you where everything gets installed, just so you have an understanding of how this all works. So the binaries, the packages, and the apps all get installed to your C drive under program files slash component one. And here you can see all these folders on my machine here broken out by a different platform. So for example, when I installed the WinForms edition, this installs the binaries for all the different versions of .NET that I installed under the bin. The demos get installed under demos from the demo explorer. The apps, like the, the Flex Report Designer, get installed under apps. The NuGet packages get installed under the packages folder. Now, typically, you don't really use these packages. You would use the ones on NuGet.org, but we make them available to you in case you want to set up your own private repository. Now, regarding the samples, the samples get installed in your documents folder under component one samples, again, broken out by platform. Now, we also publish all the samples on GitHub. So you can browse the samples online and you can find the code online, again, without downloading or installing anything. And Hunter will show you that in a minute. But that wraps up my section here, showing you how to install and update the controls. So now I'd like to pass this off to Hunter who will work with you and show you how to get started in Visual Studio, which of course is the Microsoft tool that allows you to build .NET applications. That's correct. Uh, so you can see right here, I just opened up a brand new um, application. It's a, a .NET 6 Windows form app. So there's nothing on it. If you look in our toolbox, I'm going to look for the flex grid, but turns out I don't have any controls downloaded on my machine. So I wanted to show you guys a cool way that you can also do version control and manage uh, your references within your project. We're going to use the NuGet package manager. If you see it under the, there's browse, installed, updates, and consolidate. Under the installed tab, it says no packages found. That makes sense because it's a new project. Under dependencies, you can see on the right-hand side in the Solution Explorer, there's no packages. So we want the flex grid. So let's search for it. First one that pops up, we see it's a c1.win.flex grid. <clears throat> and our versioning is 6.0. So that's the .NET 6 control, 2022.3. So we know it's the 2022.v3, and it's build 5.8.8. So we know that that's the latest build. We can look down here. You can see all the previous versions. If you wanted an older version, we're going to take the latest stable one. We're going to install it. So now we press OK. We accept that. And now uh, we'll see the package got added. And we also want to add this C1 data collection package. Uh, this binding list here. And the reason we want this is because the data type that we're going to feed our flex grid is going to be of type c1.datacollection.bindinglist, 
The reason we're going to do this is so that we can have some additional features for FlexGrid, such as grouping um, and some custom filtering work as uh, we would like with our data set. So now that we have all of our packages installed as we would expect, here in the toolbox, we can now see FlexGrid. This came from the NuGa package. So we're just going to drag and drop it onto the form. We're going to move it over here, make it a little bigger. All right, let's just run this and see how it, how it shows up now that we have it all on the form. Just basic flex grid, nothing else. OK, so here we can see uh, just an empty flex grid, but it's working as expected. Uh, as we um, obviously want to add some data, where can we go to start? Well. I have our Grape City web page right here on our home page. I'm going to take you guys to the documentation. So we're in WinForms. We go to products, select the WinForms. Here we see a documentation tab. Select WinForms. Now we go to FlexGrid. And every single one of our controls has a quick start section to help you get up to speed. You'll notice there's a .NET framework and a .NET 6 tab. Since we're in .NET 6, we want the .NET 6 tab. And here it gives you some quick steps to set up your application. We already have a FlexGrid uh, in our application, so we don't need these two lines because we dragged and dropped it from the toolbox. But we do need to bind it to a data source. It's usually your first step. So here we're going to create a custom class, this product class. It has some names, some lines of what it is, some colors, and then creates these products. Uh, from some random variables that are generated at runtime. So let's go ahead, take this code, view our code here. We're going to make a new class, paste in our product class here. And now we go back to our main function inside the form. We check out the quick start again. What's the next step? We make a list of products. Okay, very cool. This little copy button, also a big fan of that. We have a list of products now of type product. And now we want to make 100 products to populate this list of products. So we make this for loop, throw that in here. So now we have a list of products um, that are filled with products, 100 products. And we want to take our flex grid. So when you add in your flex grid, it's automatically named C1 flex grid one, when you drag and drop it, you can obviously rename this if you want, but we need to set the data source. So we have the data source. And this is where we want to bring in that. So now we see our packages here, that data collection binding list. So we're going to need a using statement up at the top. And this just makes it a little bit easier for you to reference some of the namespaces within um, the references that we're using. So we're using C1 when flex grid and we're using c1 dot data collection binding list now i can set this to a new c1 data collection binding list and set it equal to the products list all right and this should be all that we need to do here we created a product class we created a list of products from the product class. We added 100 product objects to this product list. And now we bound this product list through a C1 data collection binding list as a data source for our flex grid. So let's run this and check it out. All right, here we can see we are going to have 100 entries of these randomly generated at runtime names. And uh, you'll see here that we can just generically sort up and down by that. But what if we want some more advanced features? Well, what's really cool is that if we go back to the design time view of our form, uh, once we see the flex grid appear, perfect, we're going to just open up the smart tag. And then we could enable column filtering. And we can do some styling in here as well. So there's a bunch of styles you can see on the left. These are built-in styles. They already have different uh, approaches, but you can make your own custom style template if you'd like and apply it in here as well to the whole grid. 
We're going to do something simple just for this example. We'll pick alternate. We're going to do this back color. We'll set it to hot track because I think hot track sounds pretty cool. We'll press OK. And here we can see it alternates between this hot track color and the default white for the grid. Now, we also did this enable column filtering. What does that do? Ooh. So, hold on. Looks like we're having some quick technical difficulties. Check the error messages. Now it looks like it should. Uh, startup project could not be accomplished. Well, you know, this happens anytime you're trying to do something live. And yeah, we've never seen this one before. No. No, naturally not. Well, Maybe can try, I could. Can you try to clean it? Yeah, let's, let's give that a shot. So we go to build, clean. You know, nothing wrong with debugging that a little bit. Should have two or more class parts. Should have two or more class parts. Now, if we go back. Now, all we changed was... So, remove remove the flex grid from the form and re-add it. Yep. All right. Gotcha. So, we remove the flex grid. We're going to re-add the flex grid. If it lets... What is this? Hmm. I could just uh, make a new project real quick. And slap it all in there but um close the designer and try reopening it gotcha. gotcha all right here we go yeah now pick it up from when you added the, the filtering right so I think whenever you, you didn't make any mistake. I think this is just a problem with Visual Studio. I think whenever you try to open it up, it didn't fully load. And then you were modifying it. And whenever you're modifying something in design time, what it's doing is it's modifying the form1.designer.cs class behind the scenes. So something got out of sync. Okay. Yeah. And that makes sense. So I'm going to just enable this column filtering again. Yeah. And now I'll try to run it. Okay. Make so, sure that, okay, so you're not going to be able to set the design time stuff. All right. So unfortunately, that's not working. That's okay, though. Um, all right. Let me close this design view again. And we'll just relaunch it. We'll just continue on. Uh, it is a really cool functionality, but for whatever reason, Visual Studio does not want to play along today. Yeah. So it's, it's okay. We are using .NET 6. And so for .NET 5, Microsoft completely rewrote the designer using .NET Core. So over the past few years, I think a lot of WinForms developers, we've all experienced strange, unusual behavior with the designer. But luckily, you can do everything in code. So Hunter, right. you can actually, yeah. you can just enable filtering in code and forget the style. That's true. So let's let's figure out how to do it real quick. So how I generally go about doing this, and I would like um obviously anyone to, to follow along i like using this search bar up at the top here so i'm going to type in column filtering and in here we should be able to find a column filter just just filter. Column filter should actually pop up yeah okay filter ui maybe yeah, so this will show if we wanted to force this show. Essentially, if we were to apply that enable column filtering, what will happen is you will see this uh, menu appear. And it looks like 
We should be able to set it with just this line of code, perhaps. Let's give it a shot. So we're going to throw this in here, right here. We don't need this because we have that using statement. Now let's give it a quick go and see what happens. You know, this. Very cool. Okay, so it does show this little arrow, but it does not. So I think you're going to want to look for a property that sort of enables the filtering. Mm -hmm. So I bet you it's something like allow filter. So why don't you try using the IntelliSense? Yeah. Visual so Studio. this is probably how most developers work. Is you probably just you type in your object class and you just sort of browse like, hey, what's available? Let's check out. So we do have allow filtering. This is one way you can go about it, that IntelliSense, right? We type in the object. Yep. And then we can see all of the different properties and events and methods, depending on what they're labeled as here. So this is one really cool way of going about it. Another really cool way of going about doing this is if you go back to the design time, and if we click on the grid, down here we can see the properties, the events, uh, we make this a little bigger. You can see some of the different properties in here, including this allow filtering, which I just set to true in the code. So at runtime, right now in design, it says false, but when it runs and hits that line of code, this will be set to true. All right, I'll, one more shot on this. Oh, perfect. Here we go. Yeah. So we did it at runtime instead of design time. And what it allows you to do is you can just set only stoves. Let's say I only want to see stoves right here. It's as simple as that. You just go up and uh, give it a little click, stoves, and we got it. So uh, that that's just a really cool quick thing that you can do generally from the design time smart tag, or you can do it at uh, code behind at runtime if you'd like. Uh, one other thing that's really cool, so we'll go back to the documentation here. While we're in here, so we I did show you that search here at the top, and when you search, it highlights every word mm -hmm. on your page, the keyword. You can also use this tree view on the left-hand side. One really cool feature I want to show you is grouping. So here we see the group on the left-hand side. You could also just search group as we did earlier, and you'd find it. Here in the grouping, we see right here a simple line of code. We use group descriptions with FlexGrid, and we create a list of group descriptions, and you add in what you would like your group description to sort by based on the column name value. So with this sample code, they use customer ID. In our data set, remember we're using that products class, we don't have a customer ID. So instead, we're gonna have to list it by something else like name or line or color. Let's do line and just run this real quick. One line of code real quick, C1, Flex grade group descriptions, a new list of group descriptions, which we're supplying with the line value. Yeah. Now that could, it's running. And you could I'm actually ahead. group by multiple columns if you wanted to. Right, you could. So, but here we're just going to see that we have a line of computers, the stoves, the washers. So you can sort through any of these. And additionally, let's say we only wanted the red computers. Now we only see red computers. We could only see red cars. Um, you get the idea, but let's say I wanted to know the name value over here while I'm looking at the cost, for example, or the introduced. When did Surfair introduce this product? Um, I want to be able to see this here, but how can I keep Surfair, the name column there? Well, luckily, FlexGrid has a freezing property. Uh, it's fairly easy to implement, but I forgot how to do it. How can I find some information? Well, another cool resource that we have, if we go back to our main web page here, we can go select WinForms again from the products. There's a resources here. Next to the documentation, we have resources, and then we click samples. And this will show us right here, samples on GitHub. We want the WinForm samples. So this is another way to access the samples. If you didn't want to download them um, via the component one control panel, as Greg showed earlier, you could get them all here. We have the core and the .NET framework samples. So core has uh, .NET 6 samples, as you would expect. 
But let's just search for freezing, right? So we're going to search freezing in the repository. Right here, we see this FlexGrid, that's, uh, FlexGrid project with freezing.cs. This is within that Control Explorer uh, sample that Greg was showcasing earlier. And right down here, we see these three lines of code. And we're going to take these, throw them right into our application. So the first one is similar to this allow filtering. We're allow freezing. Uh, setting the property to allow both columns and rows. Generally, people like to freeze columns. It's the most common approach, but we do allow the ability to freeze rows if you so desired. For this, we don't want to freeze any rows. So we're just going to remove it. And we want to freeze the first column. So we're going to set this equal to one because we want the names frozen. Let's just give it a shot. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so if we go to the right, we can now see surfair or whatever name column we want, it stays as we scroll along in this grid. So that is uh, pretty cool, pretty nifty, and it's very easy to find it on GitHub. Now there's one other feature that I wanna show you guys, and this would be if we wanted to add just a quick search functionality. So uh, how can we add a search, search box? text functionality for this grid. You know, we type in a text box, try to search. Well, let's go back to grapecity.com. And here, uh, ironically, we're gonna use the search function. So at the top right, there is a little search icon. We're gonna click on that and we can type right here, search box flex grid. And uh, this will search our documentation, our forms, our blogs, pretty much just about every resource that we have um, on our website or our website links to. And uh, right here, the first one is exactly what we need, this search, the search in an entire grid. So we're using uh, C Sharp. Down here, though, we actually only need this single line of code. And I want to emphasize that uh, all of our controls are compatible with the standard Microsoft controls. So I'm going to view the toolbox, bring that back up. We're going to just look for text box. We have the standard Microsoft Visual Studio text box. You can drag and drop this. Have it right in here. There's an event for this text box called text changed. So we're going to go inside this text changed event. Oh. Right here gets put in our code and here, we want to simply uh, make it so that our flex grid applies to search. So we take that line of code that we took from the documentation, flex grid dot apply search. Maco, this would only show me Maco, but I don't want Maco. I want it as the text box value is changed, right? So the text box value is going to be text box one. That's the name of the text box item. Nope, we don't want that. We want that. The text box one, the current text, maybe. Hold on. So, nice. <laughs> I like to do this sometimes. I'm trying to figure out what actually text box one has available to it. Oh, did you know what? It looks like it might not even. And never save, that's right. So that issue that we were having with the designer when we drag and drop things from the toolbox onto the, the designer, for some reason, Visual Studio does not want to play along today. Oh man, but if we can get a text box, this text box item to stay in here, text box one, text box can you, one. Can you save uh, it? Um, yeah, sure. Oh, no, looks like it doesn't want me to save it. But essentially, this text box, it does have a, a text field inside of it or current text. And we can set that equal to this first value here. So it'd be like this dot text. And when we apply this, it'll actually run. Now, I want to show you guys a project that I already uh, finished because we're already here. And it's exactly the same as this one was set up, except it does not give us that weird error for whatever reason. So let's just run this real quick so I can give you a quick demonstration of the text box. So here you'll see we have this text box. If we type in 
uh, let's just say we want Surfair. Now we see all Surfair. We see the cars, computers, stoves. So it ignores the grouping, but keeps it. So here we have the cars, computers. But let's say we only wanted red computers and we only want them by Maco, right? So if we type in Maco, I guess we have no red computers. But you can see we can just apply different different things. We can dynamically search. If we clear these filters, we'll get everything back. And I just want to show you one last thing in the line of code uh, for the text box. It should be down here, right here. Yep. So it said apply search. We just did text box one dot text. And this is all we needed to do. Just adding in this event after having the text box uh, had everything work. So that's that is about it. That's all I got. Uh, if there's any questions or anything, please feel free. And Greg, uh, take it away. Yep. Thanks, Hunter. <clears throat> so I want to re reiterate what Hunter was really showing you was sort of how you can sort of walk through developing with our controls and take advantage of the various resources. So he could have just stuck with the documentation for everything, but we do have, you know, the samples available. We have, you know, the site-wide search, which also searches our forums and our blogs. All of those things are available to you as you're working with our controls. So you can go with whatever approach works for you. Some people like code samples, some people like documentation. Hey, we even have some videos available. But you might end up at some point reach a, a, a spot that you can't find an answer to the question you're looking for. You need help trying to implement some feature. So now I just want to briefly run down some of the additional support options that are available to you, which include our site chat, our forums, and my support. So on our website, the bottom right hand corner, you'll see this little chat button down here. You can click this to get in contact with our sales. Uh, this is primarily used for lightweight questions like, you know, can I license, you know, the, the Widgmo controls for JavaScript with Component 1 Studio Enterprise, that type of stuff. Quick stuff that our sales team could quickly answer for you. If you have a technical issue or question, we prefer you to use our forums or our my support. So for our forums, this is a great place to go see what other people are talking about with the component one controls. We have separate boards for each platform. You can ask your question here. We do officially support it, which means our support team will follow up within three business days. If you'd like a uh, more direct, and more urgent care for your support question, you can click on, or after you create an account and log in, you, you will find the my support option in the top right corner under your account. You can click that. And this allows you to create a support case right here, open new case. And then you can fill in specifically what product you're using. And this is ideal for if you find a bug or if you need help uh, implementing some technical feature. So that wraps up today's training webinar. I'd now like to open it up to anybody viewing that has any questions, you can submit them in the chat. If you have any question after this webinar, you can email us at component1-product-team.us at Grape City, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. And feel free to email us a solution to why that wasn't working earlier. If you figure that out, I'd love <laughs> to know. I'm no, just kidding, I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out myself. <laughs> so we have a question. So someone asked the 2019 1124 version is compatible with the latest release. I don't understand that question. They might I, they might be talking about the version of Visual Studio. Um, but to answer that question, if you are referring to Visual Studio, uh, all of our controls should work. Essentially, they should work in any version of Visual Studio, but officially they're supported in I believe 27, uh, 2017 and up. Let me double check on that in the meantime. Yeah, uh, they should be compatible regardless of the version of Visual Studio, but we always recommend like, if you're using the latest versions of the controls, try to stick with either 2019 or 2022 for uh, Visual Studio. Okay, they might be asking if like the component one version 2019, and then we got to follow up 
specification like working with .NET 7? I would say no, because .NET 7 was just released this past year. So you're definitely going to want to update to our newer controls. In fact, you know, we have a .NET 6 based library set for our WinForms and WPF controls. You'd want to use that if you're developing a .NET 7 application. You can technically still use .NET Framework controls in a .NET 6 or 7 app. The only problem is that then your, your end user, when they run the application, they're going to need to have .NET Framework installed. So you're not really taking advantage of the new platform. You're still forcing them to use the older .NET Framework. And maybe that's fine in your scenario. But I will also say that the designer is definitely not supported. So if you're using a .NET Framework, control like .NET 4, 5. Let's say you're using FlexGrid.NET 4, 5, and you're using in a .NET 7 application designer, the designer is not going to work. And maybe that was, maybe that was the, the, the problem hunter. Maybe you accidentally grabbed the wrong version it, of the new It's possible. I got to compare because that the first test app, I literally set everything up just to make sure it would work, and it did. And then I followed the same steps, and you know how it goes. Yep. Do we have any other questions? Another question we have is how does the licensing work? Yeah, so I mentioned that you know when you purchase any of the component one editions, you get a serial key from our support team. You can quickly activate that. But we didn't demonstrate any of the actual licensing of the application. And part of that reason is because it happens automatically for you behind the scenes. Um, there are some nuances and some differences. If you're working with .NET Framework, there's this licenses.licx file that gets generated, and that sort of manages which components you're going to be licensed. Um, but since Hunter was working with a .NET 6 or 7 application, um, none of that existed. So. But what happens is when he builds and runs the application, there is a hidden file that's created and it's sort of added as like an embedded file in the output. So Hunter, you could show that possibly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to, okay, give me one second. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm not sure if uh, if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. So uh, in here, you could pack a new version. Uh, we're going to do this show all files uh, in the solution explorer just so that it is clear. Let me also make this a little bigger. Okay. So within this bin debug.net uh, six folder. In here, actually, we'll search for it. It should be .gclicx. Yeah. So here we have a .gclicx file, an OBJ, and uh, with this, when you actually build your application and distribute it, this .gclicx file, you're gonna want this build and set to embedded resource if we can find it right here. Yeah. So. Uh, what this is yeah, going to do so, is when you actually distribute your executable um, and an unlicensed end user, like one of your customers or whoever you make this applicant for that doesn't have a component one license on their machine, when, uh, when these controls DLICX file will act as the runtime licensing and handle those issues, this end user can actually only the developers building the application need to have this runtime license file included when they build the application and distribute it. Yep. Thanks, Hunter. Yep. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I think we answered that. Uh,
can we use one license on multiple multiple machines? So the licensing model for component one is by developer. So typically if a team has three developers, you would get three separate keys, but one key we do allow to be activated on up to three machines. And the purpose for that is because a developer may have, you know, a desktop machine, they may have a laptop and a build machine, and they could put a key on all three, all three machines. And you could always deactivate on one to move to a new one. So hopefully that answers the question there. Any other questions? I think that's it. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And again, if you have any questions after this meeting, you can always reach us at component1-product-team.us at Grape City. And I'd be happy to answer you there.